had just completely lost control. Uh, I ended up uh, living basically in a tunnel that runs under Canal Street. He that is forgiven much is thankful much. Have you really been forgiven much? Welcome to Pacific Garden Mission. Since 1877, we've been in the heart of downtown Chicago, ministering to the needs of those that are on the streets. What's absolutely amazing is when you hear their stories. People just don't walk through these doors because they have nowhere else to go. There's a purpose that they come through here for. When you hear where they've been sleeping, where they've been staying, some under bridges, some on train tracks, they have nowhere to go. The stories are stunning and you are going to hear some amazing stories. Open up your heart to what God is doing through this ministry so you can see firsthand. Welcome to Pacific Garden Mission. Thank you, Pastor Phil, and a warm welcome to you watching the program. We're in our large cafeteria here. This is where a lot of people come when they walk through the doors at Pacific Garden Mission. It's a place where people are fed, and uh, this is where we really get to know people, too, in the kitchen, probably like your home where people are gathered around. But here at Pacific Garden Mission, when people walk through their doors and end up in the kitchen here having a meal, they are broken, they're discouraged, uh, they're hopeless. And this is a place where people get hope. And Jesus Christ is here every day to shine upon them. And we want to share what it's like to be at Pacific Garden Mission. I came here about 10 years ago in need of help, and I, I didn't know what to do. And Pacific Garden Mission and the staff here were very good at helping me get my life together. And they're going to do that for anyone who comes here. So later we'll have an invitation for you. But for now, we want to share this program is about the stories of lives transformed by Jesus Christ, and it's followed by what transformed them, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And I know you'll be excited to watch this. I have an amazing testimony that Daniel's recorded, and it's about a man named V, that's what we call him. And he was living in a tunnel underneath the Canal Street here in Chicago for a long time. He came in, he went into the program, and God is beginning to change his life. And I'm so excited we could share that testimony with you. I'm gonna be back afterwards. I got married young at the age of 18. I had two kids, which turned out later on, they weren't my biological kids. My first wife, because I've been married twice, she uh, decided to leave, uh, moved to California, took the kids uh, without telling me. Long story short, uh, you know, we lost track of each other for, for a long time. I remarried about 15 years later. Uh, I was in my 30s. And um, we were married for about a year and a half before we had a son. Everything seemed to be perfect, you know. I mean, everybody thought we were the perfect couple. Beautiful wife, beautiful son, uh, perfect place to live. But underneath, uh, she, she had a miscarriage, and that led to her drinking a lot. So it went f from that to me having to watch over her because she was drinking too much. She lost her job. One thing led to another, I started drinking heavily. Uh, then I lost my job at the Field Museum. I worked there for about 10 years. We both lost our jobs, so we went through the savings to pay the rent, pay the bills. I couldn't find anything else for the life of me, and uh, we ended up uh, being evicted, and my son went to her sister's home. So uh, that, was, that was probably the best place for him to be anyway. We decided to go to rehab. So we ended up at Haymarket. Uh, we were there for the 30 plus days and then they placed us at Safe Haven, at a Safe Haven down the street. I lasted for about 14 months or so. She only lasted for about six or seven. She relapsed, um, started drinking again. Uh, we lost, kind of lost track of each other at that point. And I ended up uh, relapsing too within two weeks of us just splitting up and um, 
I ended up out in the streets again, uh, on and off towards the end of that, just I ended up sleeping by the lake uh, when it was still warm. And that was because I knew the museum campus, because that's where I worked. <laughs> so I, I knew where to sleep, how to you know avoid the cops and everything. It started to get too cold towards September. And so um, one day I just, I guess I went overboard and I drank too much. I ended up in the hospital way up on the north side along the lake. And um, they asked me if I needed a place to stay. I told them, well, yeah, I have, I have nowhere to go. I think it was Catholic Charities that brought me here. They dropped me off. It was it had to be about 2 in the morning. So I was sitting in the, the newcomer's box, and I was just sitting there, just not knowing what to do. Gone past PGM several times on my way to work, because I used to live in Pilsen, so I used to ride my bike all the way to the museum. And I'd always pass by, and I'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm never going to end up in a place like that, <laughs> you know? Because uh, I thought I'd had it all figured out. So I, I ended up here. It was, I was, it was a bad time for me. I was, I was pretty depressed. Um, I didn't stop drinking, just kept going. Uh, met a few guys here that became close friends with me. Um, one of them, unfortunately, who became my best friend over two years, passed away last fall of an overdose, um, fentanyl. Recently, well, as recently as last year anyway, before I joined the New Day program, I had just completely lost control. I ended up uh, living basically in a tunnel that runs under Canal Street. I used to tell guys, you know, it's like being stuck in purgatory, I guess, I don't know. You don't know which way to go. There was one guy that used to stay down there too, another homeless guy, but not a lot of people like to venture down there because it's not, it's not pitch black, but there's not a lot of lighting and it's all, there's about a layer of dust about that thick on the ground. Um, yeah, it's like walking on the moon, you step on it and there's like a little cloud of dust. It just, we were literally used to sleep up against the fence. Unfortunately, there's, I mean, there's trash down there from like the nineties. And with that trash, you'd find syringes and you know, all kinds of other still crack pipes, things like that. As crazy as it sounds, it was, it was a really dark time for me. And I, I just, um, I felt like I was at my, at the end of my rope. Just, I couldn't take it anymore. Um, I was basically drinking myself to death down there. Uh, just waking up just to go out and get more, more alcohol. Um, but I, uh, I did, a couple times I did come close to just trying to opt out, trying to end it all, you know. Thank God I, I, I didn't, you know, I, I sobered up enough to kind of, um, realize where I was and what I was doing. You, you go down there and you forget about the world, the world forgets about you, and you, it's just, it's you're just down there, literally. And it's, that, that actually brings back something I told Philemon, because he, um, he asked me how I was feeling about, you know, being here, about staying here, or whatever. And um, I told him, you know, gradually I've, I've come to accept the reality that I was living and how I am now. Um, but at one point, uh, I think I used to I used to tell people all the time, "Oh, where do you live? Oh, PGM. Oh, how's how's it living there?" I'm like, "Well, you're not really living there. You're just kind of waiting to die. You're just existing." Yeah. And I, I walked out of that tunnel, and until it just everything was buzzing in my head, and until I reached the uh, very entrance of the tunnel, I stepped out into the sunlight and just went quiet and the first thing that came to, to mind was I need help <laughs> I need help so I basically ran back over here which is it's not that far it's about four or five blocks so I ran back over here spoke to the the, the head of uh, the offices over on the overnight side and um, I told him I said you know I need help I seriously need help um, Pastor Phil was right there actually and uh, I spoke to him too, because you know I didn't know I'd done rehab several times before, well, three times, two, three times, and um, I it I just felt like it wouldn't work if I went back to Haymarket. I asked them if there was anything else that they would recommend. 
um, they were first at first we were looking at other places for me to go to, to, to do rehab and stuff but I told them I needed something something more you know I needed something I don't know spiritual I said that's when they recommended the program and I, I was reluctant I mean I'd, I'd heard so many things over the last you know two years before that um, not all good <laughs> but you know I, I figured what's it gonna hurt you know so I, I joined the program and I was I was pretty I was pretty much a, a nervous wreck for the first two to three weeks I, I just I was going through withdrawals and, and not not comfortable in my own skin um, wasn't really talking to anybody uh, I just kept to myself I was isolating myself two or three guys started talking to me like you know come on you know you gotta you gotta kind of try a little harder because you know it's not gonna work if you don't do something about it and so I did I, I started um, I opened up my heart I guess to to Jesus which I had not really ever done that before um, it was to say the least it was an eye-opening experience because uh, it it didn't pretty much save my life it actually did save my life I, I keep telling uh, Philemon uh, you know that I, my my way of thinking nowadays is his will be done because if it wasn't for for him and for everything that everyone here at PGM from my counselors to my co-workers to the other program participants uh, if it wasn't for a combination of everything I, I don't think I'd be here I'd either still be out there or I, I'd probably be dead yeah so uh, I think I, I need to fix myself before I try to fix anything else yeah and um, and that's that's what that's what the program has basically helped me do was uh, repair most of the damage that I that I did to myself and my life you know the people around me to stick around and for about two months because the program's three months long for about two months I didn't want to go out by myself uh, my counselor would ask me you know like your meds are waiting at Jewel or whatever and I'd be like nah I'm like ah, you, you can get them for me but that was because I was still afraid of, of relapsing because, you know, there's liquor right there. And as soon as you go in the entrance, it's like to your right. And that's it's the first thing you see. So um, finally, I, I broke through that and um, I started going out there by myself and, you know, getting my medication, taking a little walk here and there. And uh, before long, I was, you know, almost done with the program. So they, they asked me, they're like, well, would you... Would you like to go back to the overnight side, or do you have a place to go, or would you like to join the New Life program? So I said, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I figured I'd keep going, and I did. So um, it's, it's done wonders for me because I used to look at everything in a negative light, and it was all darkness for me, you know? It's like everything I did, um, there was always a, a but at the end of the, you know, every sentence for me. But, you know, I, I, I don't know, or, you know, what if. But um, I pretty much put my myself, you know, my my life in God's hands, and um, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful that um, anything and everything that happens to me now is in his hands. I hope you enjoyed the testimony you just watched, knowing that there's hundreds of testimonies like that here at Pacific Garden Mission, and know that help is here. If you need help, could you call the number on your screen or come through the doors here at Pacific Garden Mission, meet with a counselor, and find out what God has for you here. It's an amazing place, and I believe God is waiting for those of you who need help and want to come through our doors. And if you're in the Chicago area and you want to come and see what God is doing here at Pacific Garden Mission, every Saturday we have a wonderful destination 
transformation experience. It starts with a tour of this amazing building. Uh, it's more than the building though. It's the people you're going to meet on the tour. People that have been through the programs, people in the programs, people who have graduated and are on staff. 62% of our staff are people that came through these doors. I'm one of them. And it's a blessing to be here and come and see what God is doing. I know you'll be changed and you'll have some stories to tell after our tour. And then, speaking of stories, we're going to take you to the Unshackled award-winning radio drama which is acted out live here every Saturday. You'll be amazed when you sit in the audience and watch real actors acting out a story of a life transformed by Jesus Christ. Uh, there was tears in the audience and laughter and you will have some stories to tell when you leave the Unshackled award-winning radio program. Then we'll bring you down to this beautiful kitchen I'm sitting in. It holds about 700 people and you'll be able to have a family style meal with friends and uh, relatives, whoever you bring. Uh, we'll have a meal together and then we're going to go to the praise and testimony service and that's what gave birth to this television program is the praise and testimony service where our president, Pastor Phil Kwiatkowski, will bring a gospel message to you. Afterwards, we'll have meet and greet with the president. It's a three hour time slot to come here on a Saturday and see what God is doing and I know you won't be disappointed. You will have stories to tell. And if you come back, you might want to come back and volunteer. We have uh, things you can do here, many things you can can do here. One of them is making beds upstairs in our large dormitory area. You can help us in the laundry room. You can serve meals in this beautiful cafeteria. It's a time where you can just be involved at Pacific Garden Mission and later if you want to be involved in the ministry, the men can go in the men's day room and the women in the women's day room and we even have room for some preachers here to help us in the evening services. So think about giving some time to Pacific Garden Mission and you'll be blessed. And finally, we'd like to ask you if you'd like to help us financially, you can go to a secure website right now and give a one-time gift or a monthly recurring gift. And as you do, I know you'll be blessed because each month you're going to receive a newsletter of a life transformed by Jesus Christ. You'll get the picture, you'll read the short story, you can see the statistics of what your uh, money is doing here at Pacific Garden Mission and know this when you give to the mission you're really giving through the mission to the people that need it the most like so many people whose lives have been transformed like myself and it's a blessing to do that so go to the secure website right now and give that one-time gift and get your newsletter coming in the mail and uh, you'll be blessed as you do and also we'd like to offer you a copy of the television program you're watching right now in DVD form we'd love to have you share it with a friend relative or a neighbor who's in need of hearing the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So if you've enjoyed this program, go ahead and order a free copy. The DVD will be sent to you. You can go to our website and order that DVD. It's very easy to do. Go to our secure website and order that DVD and we'll send it to you right away. And now I want to turn your attention to the auditorium where Pastor Phil will preach a gospel message and this is on how Lazarus was raised from the dead. Last week we saw what I believe was one of the most amazing and public of miracles that Jesus Christ ever did, and that was the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Again, as we saw last week, imagine if you were standing there and Jesus walks up to a tomb, and even the sisters were skeptical because they said he's been dead four days, and by now he, what is he, what is he now? He stinketh. I love the King James on that. He stinketh. But he says, Lazarus, come forth. And, and there he was. Now imagine the emotion of Martha and Mary. The, the two sisters that were absolutely distraught at burying their brother. Now many of us here have been to funerals and you know the feeling how empty it is when you lose a loved one. Imagine if you had that loved one return to you and you knew who the object was that returned that individual to you. How would you feel about them? Oh man, gratitude, thankfulness, appreciation. There's really no words in the English language and that's what we're going to look at tonight is worship. So again, real quick, we saw Lazarus was risen from the dead. In verse 47, we touched upon this last week, then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what do we for this man do with many miracles? If we let him alone, 
all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. One of them, named Caiaphas, being of the high priest the same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, that the whole nation should perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being the high priest this year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. But not that for the nation only, but also he should gather together in one the children of God which were scattered abroad. And from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. That's where we ended last week. The point here is they had their minds made up. And, and I hope for some of you tonight that your minds are not made up. At least, at least be open to the possibility that there is a God in heaven who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. That the Bible is the word of God. That these don't have your mind made up where you're so closed. And then one day, like Caiaphas did, stand before Almighty God and say, I was wrong. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, the Pharisees wanted to kill him. And now look at verse 57 of chapter 11. Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. Later on, that's where Judas came into play because they paid him. They were looking where this guy is. But now we look to chapter 12 and we're going to look at this topic again, as I said a few moments ago. How do you think Mary and Martha felt? Their brother, who was dead, they were mourning. He was gone. Four days, they had the funeral. The, the mourners came out. And now he's alive again. Look at chapter 12, verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. They're sitting there having a meal. Mary, Martha, Lazarus. Again, how do you think the sisters felt? Gratitude, appreciation, thanksgiving. What is worship? I think in our contemporary society, we have really lost the true meaning of what worship is. Unfortunately, we'll hear this in, in American Christianity let us go to church and get our worship on, right? Let's go to a place and worship there. And unfortunately, what worship has become, it's become a show. It's become entertainment. I remember once I was visiting a church and this guy came out on his guitar. And, and if you're from Chicago in the 70s, you remember Loop Radio Station was the hard rock radio station. He had a Loop shirt on, long hair, and he was cranking on that thing, and he was playing. But it was a show. There wasn't any worshiping going on, but of him maybe. But, but what has happened to us as a church? And, and I want to tell you tonight, worship is not a place we go to. I, I think of the, the discussion that Jesus Christ had with the Samaritan woman. She said in John 4, 20, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Is it Jerusalem? Is it here, Mount Gerizim? Where is the place? Is it the Baptist church? No, it's this church over here. Is it the Presbyterian? Is it the Method? Is it the Church of God in Christ? Well, it's the Pentecostal. They really got it going on. And when I get up this morning, I'm going to go to this place of worship. That was her argument. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. It's not about a place. Ye worship, ye not know what we know, what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in what? True worship has to have semblance of the truth. 
If you just get into raw emotionalism and a person get, can get up and say anything. I, I did this years ago and maybe it was mean. It was at the old mission. We had a guy downstairs. Our classroom was downstairs. And uh, I'd, you'd get up there to, to teach. And no matter what you would say, this guy would say, Amen, Amen, Amen. And he, Amen. And, and, and I said, I don't know if he even knows what we're saying. So one day, on purpose, I got up there and said, heresy. I said, the Bible's not the word of God. Amen. It's not true. Amen. I said, What's that? do you know what you're just saying amen to? You cannot not only worship in spirit, but in what? It's a response to what I know to be true. And I think in modern Christianity, it has become entertainment. And these ladies here that were appreciative that their brother was risen from the dead. Oh, we're going to see an amazing act of worship tonight. Let me give you the etymology of the word. The word is derived from an old English word called worth-ship, meaning to venerate, worship, honor, show unto an object which has been uh, 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 metalized as worthliness or worth-ship to give at its simplest worth to something. So worship is me giving worth to something. Now if I have been saved by Almighty God and I know what I've done, I think of the one story in Luke chapter 7 where Jesus asked the question about two debtor, debtors and a lady that came and anointed Jesus and all this stuff. He said, he that is forgiven much is thankful much, right? Why was she so uh, worshipful or so enthusiastic? Because she was forgiven. And when you realize where some of us were and some of the things that some of us have done, some of the places we've been, and the fact that we have come to faith in the living God and He has forgiven us, that causes me to ascribe worth to my creator and I worship him. I ascribe worth because of, because of what he's done. I was reading a story. First responders were reunited Wednesday with a toddler they saved from almost drowning. A Juan Vega was giving her children a bath one night when her son Juan went under the surface of the water. The boy's father, uh, Jorge, started CPR and the paramedics were able to stabilize him after they arrived on scene. He was taken to the hospital Wednesday and the family thanked the paramedics in person for saving their son. Now why, were, why was the family so enthusiastic to thank those paramedics? Why? They saved their son. Do you think it was boring? Do you think they would be there when let's go meet the paramedics and they'd yawn? They'd sleep? No, they were enthusiastic. Those guys saved my children. I want to thank you. I want to, I want to show my appreciation because my son was about to die and yet you saved him. We are ascribing worth to you and to what you do. I want to thank you, but we as Christians, how much more Shall we be thankful and show gratitude to a holy God that pardoned us? He that is forgiven much is thankful much. Amen. Have you really been forgiven much? Worship, worship, worship. Again, John chapter 12, verse 3. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly. It just wasn't costly. It was very costly. And anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house, of the, the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. So I, I was studying it this week. And that was an ointment that would come from the Himalayas, from India. And it was, it was imported very costly. And I saw some estimates anywhere from $12,000 to $54,000 Anywhere in the middle to, to the low end, $12,000 bottle worth of bottle you poured on Jesus. That's why one of the disciples, Judas, who was greedy, it gave him pause. Why would she give such an honor to Jesus Christ? 
because of what Jesus Christ just did. My brother was in the tomb and my heart was broken. I could not be comforted. I was in sorrow and tears. He's seated at the table here with me and there's nothing that I can give to this individual. And everything I have I'm going to give because I am ascribing worth to this person right here that did something for me. Oh, that is worship. Hallelujah. Three quick words tonight when I think of worship. Gratitude, sacrificial, and acceptable. Gratitude. You know, gratitude always has an object. I mean, sometimes we just feel happy. Sometimes I just don't feel gratitude. I'm gratitude when there's something to be thankful about, right? Something so, so gratitude has a, 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 an object. I am thankful when I am in church, when I'm on the streets, when I'm shopping, wherever you are, if you're truly born again, you live with a thankful attitude because I was headed to hell and I was saved by a holy God and all of my sins forgiven. And if you and I would really catch the magnitude of our sin, we have forgotten the holiness of God. I, I was talking to somebody today and sometimes in our churches our music dictates our theology and we have forgotten the awe holiness of almighty God. We sing today, I am a friend of God. He's my buddy. He's my hometown. He's my guy, Jesus. But when I realize holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, there is awe in this holy, righteous, pure God has chosen to pardon me of all my sin and filth and iniquity through the cross and by the blood of Jesus Christ. How can I not show gratitude and be thankful. How can she not do this? The question wasn't why she poured such an expensive ointment on the feet of Jesus. The real question, how could she not? The worth of it didn't matter because of the worth of him, the one who did that act. So again, gratitude has an, an object and it also has a reason. There's a reason that we are thankful today but also understand this about worship. Not only is it gratitude, and we are so thankful, it is sacrificial. I think of 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 24. This is the words of King David, and listen to what he says. And King David said to Ornan, No, but I will verily buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor burnt offering without cost. He was willing to give it to David. David said, no, I'm going to buy it from you. Why? Because I can't give to the Lord what cost me nothing. The point is real worship has sacrifice. Well, we're going to see that tonight. Sacrifice in how I live my life, how I treat other people, how I am as my own person. This is what real worship is, is it's sacrifice. Yes, there's certain people that annoy us. Yes, there's certain situations we may not like. But if I'm going to sacrifice and if I'm going to worship based on the cost of what Jesus Christ did for me, I ascribe Him worth. I can't give to Him that which costs me nothing. Amen? Real worship has sacrifice. I think of Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a what? living sacrifice that's worship terminology it says holy acceptable unto god which is your reasonable service which is your reasonable worship what i why should i be honest in all of my dealings because you know because of what god did for me i remember one time years ago i went to dominic's and uh the lady uh she gave me back uh, i forgot what it was whether it was uh extra $40, extra $20, whatever it was. I knew she gave me more change because she was confused. So I, I'm, I'm sitting there, and, you, you know, and of course, I think, well, it's her mistake. All have sinned. I said, I can't. I said, ma'am, I said, you know, you, you gave me too much change back. Oh, she said, oh, that's, that's right. And so I, so I, you know, I give the change back. And so I'm walking out to the car with my cart. I'm looking at my, my receipt, and I realize there's something in there that they didn't charge me for. 
And then I'm thinking, oh, what are you trying to do? I mean, man, I'm thinking, you know, it's their mistake. Is that... So I had to march all the way back into Dominic's and show my, I have this, I was not charged. Why do I do that? Because I'm a good man, an honest man, a righteous man. No, I did it because that's my reasonable service. That is my worship. That's worship. I don't lie because I'm a good man. I don't lie because of worship. I give worth to my creator. And I think the reason so many people have trouble in church on Sundays is because they're not really worshiping during the week and this just becomes a show. Get it over with. This is, again, look at this. It says here, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, inward holiness, honesty. So when you're out there and you have the opportunity to cheat, steal, and lie, the reason I won't do it, it's not because I'm a good guy, because I worship the God that saved me. And that's what real worship is, it's sacrifice. I think of Philippians 4.18, let me quote this to you. But I have of all, and the book of Philippians is a great book. Paul was incarcerated in a Roman jail. But I have all and abound, and I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor, a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. A church decided to gather all their goods and to give it to a prisoner by the name of Paul. Why did they do it? He says right here the things that were sent from you are an odor of sweet smell. A sacrifice acceptable. Sometimes worship is giving to somebody in need. Is there somebody that needs an arm around them? Some people have been picked on their whole life. Are you going to pick on them too? Real, real worship is sacrifice. Real worship is giving to somebody in need. Paul was in jail and they gathered together the things and they gave it to Paul. And he said, this is worship. It's acceptable to God. An offering of sweet smell. This is worship. But if we treat people just like the world does and we're no different than they are, and if we lie just like they lie, if we cheat just like they cheat, no wonder why when we come to church on Sunday to quote-unquote worship, we have a hard time being there. Got no, no problem getting excited during a bear game, even though there's not a lot to get excited about, I'll be honest with you. No, 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 no problem getting excited about things that I'm interested in. Do you want real worship? This was worship to the sisters. That they can bow down at the feet of Jesus and pour an ointment upon him anywhere from $12,000 to $50,000. This was acceptable to God. Worship, worship, worship is sacrificial. Again, what are you sacrificing? Maybe it's time. Sometimes somebody might need a phone call. Somebody that they'll never return your call. They, they, they might not even be a nice person. They might not have any means. But you know what real worship is you doing it? Maybe there's somebody in this ministry here. Boy, they annoy you. Boy, they're not very nice. I mean, there, there was a guy I was talking to one time, and there was a lady we both knew. She was not a very nice lady, and I saw him talking to her one time. I said, man, that's, that's cool. He said, you know, he said, he said, Pastor, that's my ministry. I'm just going to love her regardless. You know what that was? Worship. Who are you loving regardless? Yeah, again, they might smell, they might not be nice, but worship is sacrifice. What are, you, what are you ascribing to the one who died for? Is he worthy? Not only is worship sacrificial, it is acceptable. In the Old Testament, the brothers came before God with two different offerings, Cain and Abel, right? Abel came with the works of his hands, I mean, it was, it was Cain that came with the works of his hand, and Abel had a blood sacrifice, right? And many times in the Old Testament, you see blood sacrifices. Why, why the blood sacrifice? When they took a sheep, the imagery was, this should have been you. What is being done to the sheep should have been done to you. When God told Adam, the day you eat, you shall surely what? That's the penalty. The wage of sin is what? What's happening to the sheep should be happening to you. And I'm using this as a picture because one day somebody's going to come, Jesus Christ, who was sinless, and what happened to him is what should have happened to you and I. 
So, so Abel knew to give to God a, a blood sacrifice. And God didn't accept both. He rejected Cain's sacrifice, did he not? Because you can't come to God with the works of your hands. You need to come to God with the blood. So one sacrifice was acceptable and one was not. Not only do we just worship, all roads lead to God. No, it has to be acceptable. Well, no matter how you do it, it does matter how you do it. Ask Cain. He was rejected, murdered his brother, but was rejected. Worship not only has to show gratitude, not only has to be sacrificial, it also must be acceptable. Romans chapter 14 is a very interesting chapter. Romans chapter 14. In, in, in the essence of the chapter is how do we treat what the Bible calls our weaker brother? Look at this, Romans 14. Him that is weak in faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. A guy might not be strong in faith, and many times we want to argue with him and debate and convince him. And again, sometimes, say, remember, sometimes just don't answer a fool according to his folly. There's sometimes people ask questions, not because they're trying to learn knowledge, because they want to get into an argument and a debate with you, right? He says, if he's weak in faith, then he goes on, for one believeth one, uh, for one he may eat uh, all things, another who is weak eateth only herbs. One guy, the strong brother, says, and in the New Testament, there's no prohibition against meat. You want to eat a steak, you want to eat a filet mignon, you want to eat a pork chop or whatever. The other guy says, oh no, I got to eat a salad, I only eat a kale, I only eat all this stuff, and, and, and they end up arguing with each other. But look what he says, let, him, uh, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him with eateth, for God hath received him. Don't get in this dispute with your brother about what you're eating. You don't want to eat bacon? That's great. There's more for me. I'm cool with it. I'm all right. Man, his brother ain't spiritual. This guy's tripping. He ain't right with God. You know, no, he says, why are you arguing about all these other things? And, and I love what he says later on. Look down, if you would, to verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge rather this, that no man put a stumbling block or occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean in itself. Talking about meat, ain't nothing unclean. In the New Testament, there were certain restrictions and prohibitions. In the New Testament, God said there's nothing unclean. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, tell him what? It's unclean. If he says it's unclean, cool. I'm not going to argue with you. But look down all the way, if you would, in verse 18. For he that in these things, what things? Treats his brother with respect properly. He that in these things, look at this here. A serveth God and is what? Acceptable to God. You want to worship? How do you treat your brother? You want to worship? You say, I want to worship. It's not about Sunday getting up there and getting your worship on and you go outside in the parking lot and cut people off. You go outside and home and holler and shout. You, you treat people like dirt. You treat people like garbage. You holler at folks. You debate and argue. People know that you're mean, you're ugly and everything else. And you come to church, hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord. And, they, and, and what are you doing? How do you treat your fellow brother is what he's saying here. If you treat him in the right way, this is acceptable to God. Powerful. Treating people right. Romans 15, 16, let me read this to you. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Paul says, I'm going to the Gentiles. Why? I'm doing my calling because this is acceptable to God. Remember, wherever you serve, it's God who called you there. The reason I serve, it's not because man called me. God called me. And that's what Paul said, offering up of the Gentiles. Paul was shipwrecked. Paul, was, oh, he was whipped. He was beaten and all these things. Why are you doing it? What does he say there? Look again. 
that the offering up of the Gentiles, hallelujah, might be acceptable and approved. Look at this, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. My friend, do you look at where you're at in life as worship or just work? I mean, if Paul looked at it at work, he would have walked away. Man, I go to this city, they throw stones at me, I'm out of here. You find another missionary. I ain't doing all this. Going to Rome and the ship sinks and I got to go on this island and the snake bites my hand. I'm done with this stuff. Man, I got to talk to the union about this. No, no. Paul said, no, I'm not doing it for you. It's like I remember hearing a story about a young believer. He was brand, brand new saved. Went to a church and it was a, a bunch of dignified ladies were at a prayer meeting. And they prayed and they used the proper King's English. Did you ever hear anybody pray and they get very theological and you wonder if they're praying to God or trying to impress people, amen? When it came time for this young man to pray, he prayed. And man, his, his words weren't real polished. His phraseology wasn't real good. And I mean, it was a rough prayer. One of the old ladies, when he was finished, said, Son, what you said offends me. He said, Excuse me, ma'am, I wasn't talking to you. Amen? And ultimately, when I serve, yes, I respect people and those in authority, but... I, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it as worship to a holy God. Why? Because he saved me. And I ascribe worth to him. And I want to give him worship that is acceptable. I think of another verse in 1 Timothy 5, 4. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home, and requite their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. How many people, and if we're just honest, uh, you know, maybe your parents took you to church as a kid, and not all, but for some, what you saw at home was complete dysfunction. And then the parent would go to church and hallelujah and scream. You know, dad is there at church in the morning, I told you to get down here on time, we're leaving. You old windbag, get down here fussing and fighting the whole way. Man, I wish you'd be the whole time to church. As soon as they get to the church, a transformation takes place. God bless you, brother. And how are you? Yes. Rejoicing in the Lord. Would you like to do the offering today? Oh, of course I would. Your humble servant would love to do anything. Amen. And then you get home. Wait, wait. Real worship is not the guy you are in church. Who are you when nobody's looking? But if any widow have uh, children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home. At home. And requite their parents, for this is good and acceptable. Acceptable worship is this. At home. Don't sit there and complain about the pastor. Complain about this. Complain about that. And go to church in the transformation. Oh, hallelujah. Can I do the solo today, pastor? I would be so honored and pleased. Amen. Real worship, that is acceptable. Look, if you would, to Hebrews 13, 15. And this really, this ties it in together. Hebrews 13, 15, this ties all of it together. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God. How often? Wow. I mean, stop right there. How often? I mean, that's why the word sacrifice of praise because sometimes I don't want to do continually. I don't want to do it when things don't go my way. I don't want to do it when I'm not happy. I don't want to do it when there's a situation I don't like. But it's a sacrifice to say, God, no matter my circumstance, I'm going to hallelujah. I, don't you love it when, when Paul was in prison, he was singing hymns to God? Can you imagine that? When Peter was in jail, he fell asleep. But when Paul was in prison in the book of Acts, can you imagine? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that had saved a wretch. Like, can you imagine that? Man, you're in jail. You're going to face the magistrate tomorrow. You could lose your head. You could lose everything. Oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Hey, I've gone to the doctor, and I have a bad note from the doctor. Things aren't going well with my parents or my kids fiscally. Oh, amazing grace, how sweet. The... And that's what he says. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice. A sac Don't just praise when it's going your way. Hey, you got to raise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. No. How about when you get laid off? 
How about when things don't go your way? How come when you're, when you're around people you don't like being around? How come when all these things then offer the sacrifice of praise to God? How often? What does it say? How often? Continually. And, and look what he says. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. He defines it for us. Again, you want to offer sacrifice to God? You want to offer worship right here? That's why, again, the American church is so weak. Look at our homes. Look at our lives. Look at what goes on. We grumble, we complain, we murmur. We're not people that are realize what is my mission, who is it that, that I serve, and why I serve him. I'm doing it for me. And if I'm doing it for me, I'm going to complain. Oh, that sacrifice. And look what he says here, verse 16. I love it. But he also, you see the sacrifice of praise, but to do good and to communicate what? Don't forget this. Remember, worship is not only upward, it's also inward, your holiness, and it's also outward in how you treat people. You see, and I believe the reason that we have a tough time worshiping on Sundays is we're not doing any of these things. If we don't do it upward, I'm not going to thank God for that. If we don't do it inward, I'm going to steal and cheat and lie when I can. Nobody's watching anyway. If I'm going to treat people like dirt and like garbage, I can't come to church and praise Him. It says, but to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is what? Well pleased. Sacrifices, this. He didn't. Jesus said there's a day coming, not in Jerusalem, not in Mount Gerizim. There's a day coming where it's not about the place you go, but about the person you are and who's the object of your uh, worth and your desire, and that's Jesus Christ. As we close, I was reading an article today. Did you ever been in a situation where uh, maybe you're sitting there, maybe you're watching a game, and you think, I want to go get some chips, and you go into the kitchen and you say, I forgot what I came here for, right? Right, I forgot, and they're talking about, it was some article about, you know, psych, psychologically when we go through doorways, whatever it was. But I like when we said, well, I've done that before. You get some, what, what did I come here for? I don't remember. But I think a lot of Christians do that Sunday in church. What, what, what did I come here for? I got up, I put my clothes on, I drove. What, what did I come here for? I know why I'm here, and I know who I am, because I know what he did for me. Why did she put that expensive ointment on Jesus Christ as her act of worship because she knows what Jesus Christ did for her. And she was showing him ultimate worth. Her gratitude, her thankfulness, it was sacrificial and it was acceptable. Let's do the same thing to the one that died for us. Let's have everybody close in prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ, and again, don't be like the Pharisees. They had their minds made up. Uh, they were Pharisees and they don't care if Jesus raised people from the dead. They weren't going to believe. My friend, don't meet Jesus Christ as your judge when you could have met him as your savior. Jesus Christ died for you. It doesn't matter what sin you've committed. The Bible says the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. It's not good people that go to heaven and bad people that go to hell. You might think, man, I'm such a bad person. Jesus Christ died for sinners. You might say tonight, I, I need to be forgiven. I want a new start. I want a new life. Come to Jesus Christ today. So you say, Pastor, I want to be forgiven. I want to be saved. Raise up your hand all throughout the auditorium. I want to be forgiven and accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Anybody else today? Those that have raised their hands, I want you to pray with me in the quietness of your heart. You don't have to pray out loud. And I'm going to pray what's called a sinner's prayer. And remember, the words don't save you. It's not magical. But what saves you is Jesus. And I'm giving you a model prayer that if you cry out to Almighty God with repentance and faith, God will save you tonight. But pray something simple. Say, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, and tonight I come to you. I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins, was buried and rose again. I accept him as my Savior. Forgive me in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, I pray that you were encouraged by those testimonies. And 
challenged by the word. And as we close, I don't want to close by having you purchase anything. I want to close by challenging you. Well, what, a, what an amazing story about uh, worship. Mary coming to Jesus and Martha and Lazarus and that whole situation coming before God. And they were so grateful because of what Jesus Christ had done for them. What has he done for you? You see, the Bible says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? There is a lot of uncertainty in this world. We hear of war, you hear of inflation, you hear of all the things going on in our city streets and riots and everything happening. There's a lot of uncertainty. And so what some of us do is we try to accumulate more. I need to invest more. I need to buy this more. And, but what shall it profit if a man shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? The most precious commodity that you possess is your soul. My friend, if you die, where will you spend eternity? Simply put, Jesus Christ died for your sin. Why? We've all sinned. The wages of sin is death. The word wages is a payment. If you worked a job and you said at the end of a week and they told you your wage is $1,000, at the end of the week, what would you expect? Well, $1,000. Why? That's my wage. A wage is an expectation. What's the wages of sin? Death. And the second death is a lake of fire. What do you mean sin? Any sin. Well, if the wages of sin is death and we've all sinned, are we all in trouble? The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life. Salvation is nothing to be earned. It's a gift. And what you need to do is receive that gift by faith. Jesus Christ. Why don't you do that today? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? The most precious commodity you have. Why don't you make certain today that you know Jesus Christ. Bow with me if you would. Pray a simple prayer. Cry out to God. Say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner, but today I accept the gift of eternal life. I believe Jesus Christ died for my sin, was buried, and rose again. Forgive me in Jesus' name. Amen. If you trusted Christ today and accepted that gift, we would love to know. Write us, call us, tell us. And one final favor can you do for us? Can you please contact the stations that is broadcasting this program, letting them know the blessing Pacific Garden Mission is to you. And you might say, well, why? Because these stations are good to us. And they need to know that somebody's watching. And if you're watching, tell them, write them, call them. PGM TV has been a blessing. But God bless you. Thank you for watching. Oh.